This podcast contains potentially adult language, adult themes, definitely drinking, and possibly sexual context. Listener discretion is advised. To Drinking with Authors, the podcast. I'm your host, Erica Lance, the effervescent C.R. Rice. I thought of that earlier and held on to it. <laughs> is my co host today. And we have the amazing Phil Folio. Woo! Woo! They had a track. I checked. A track is added. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so let's talk about what we're drinking. So I did something. Um, very inventive where for those that normally listen, they don't. Okay. So this is lightning from skunk brother spirits, our sponsor. <laughs> WA10 coupon code. It's basically just gasoline. Um, just kidding. It's actually well-meaning gasoline. Anyway, I put cranberry juice, pomegranate juice, and a shot of the elderberry syrup in this. I'm calling okay. Then get well and knock me on my ass. That is what I'm calling it. <laughs> All right. I like it. Okay, CR, what are you drinking? I am still doing the weird drink I did last week. It's the um, lemonade with the smushed up raspberries and a hefty shot of vodka. Very cool. Phil, what are you drinking? I am drinking Ardbeg, which is a fine... Uh, Scottish whiskey, Irish, or it says I, Inslay, says Islay single malt Scotch whiskey. It is one of your peatier uh, whiskeys, and uh, I like a good fighting whiskey. So that is my drink. I'm going to have to check that out. I will tell you a funny, funny drinking story, and then we move to books. I was out to dinner last night with a friend of mine and he was reading a menu and the Chardonnay said uh, with a hint uh, or a flavor of uh, red peppers or something like that. And um, I want to say like jalapenos. And he was like, this has got to be the wrong description for the swine. Nope. That's exactly <laughs> what it tasted like. I don't wow. even know how I made that happen. It was literally on a steakhouse menu, but he got it and he was like, <laughs> um, he's like, I thought it was the wrong description. And I'm like, obviously uh, not. Obviously that is so not. terrible. I wish I'd gotten the name of it, but I was laughing too hard anyway. Um, okay, Phil, for those yes. out there that might not have read your work, can you tell us what you write? You want the thing I'm here for or my entire curricula vitae? That is up to you. This is your podcast, my friend. You can oh take gosh, it over no. with whatever you'd like to talk about. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Well, I've been active in science fiction since uh, the 1970s. Um, let's see. Uh, I... Uh, <sighs> Let's see, I uh, used to write a, a comic strip in Dragon Magazine called What's New with Phil and Dixie, oh, wow. uh, which uh, talked about uh, d and I've uh, done independent comics. I have uh, had a series called Buck Godot Zap Gun for Hire. I had a, uh, I did a lot of work for uh, DC Comics. I did a series called Angel and the Ape and Stanley and his Monster, and I worked on Plastic Man. Um, gosh, let's see. Uh, I co-wrote a novel with the late Nick Pilata called Illegal Aliens that came out in like 86, I think. Uh, I wrote, man, I wrote stuff for a whole bunch of comic book companies that are now dead, like... Uh, I did Dynamo Joe with uh, Doug Rice for First Comics. I did uh, uh, two Star Blazers strips for uh, Kamiko. Um, let's see. I did some backup features in a book called Grimjack. <sighs> let's see. I... Um, Adapted uh, Robert Asprin's first myth adventure novel, Another Fine Myth, into a comic book series called Myth Adventures. 
Um, let's see. I did an adult comic called Xenophile. I um, oh, do tell me, does that involve an alien? <laughs> I love the what? name. Oh, said, thank you. oh, do tell me, does that involve an alien? I love the name. <laughs> It involved all kinds of things. Um, let's see. Since, writing a note. No, just there kidding. you go. <laughs> uh, since uh, 2000, uh, my wife and I have been uh, working on a webcomic called Girl Genius. And uh, that has been, uh, well, we've been working on that for like the last 20 some odd years. It updates every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, we started doing novelizations of the uh, comic, and uh, the fourth one of those just came out. And the thing that ostensibly I'm here for is uh, The Night Sheriff, which uh, is a... Uh, fantasy detective horror humor novel that is absolutely not set in Disneyland that came out uh, late last year. <laughs> um, an introduction and a disclaimer at the same exact time. Exactly right. Um, let's see. Uh, we won a bunch of awards. Girl Genius uh, won the first three uh, uh, Hugo Awards for Best Graphic Story, at which point we removed ourselves from the category because, come on. Um, and then, uh, well, actually, I won a couple of fan artist Hugo, Hugos back in the 70s. Um, and that's, I've also done a bunch of artwork for uh, game companies, uh, did a lot of work for uh, Steve Jackson Games, and uh, Kaya and I were some of the original artists for uh, Magic the Gathering. Oh, wow. Yeah. This is, so this career trajectory of yours, I'm all about the big words today, Sierra. I hope you're paying attention. And, uh, I've been listening. I'm waiting I for do the next video. Every time I get one in there. Um, <laughs> uh, what? It seems like you had a very fun career, though. Is this like, is this, were you able to start and go into doing comics or did you have to pretend to be something else in the beginning? Never had a real job. That uh, is <laughs> amazing and well done. Thank you. Yes. Because not a lot of people get to say that. Did, did you draw comics when you were younger or where, what, at what point did you go, you know what, this is what I want to do? Um, that's very interesting and annoys a lot of people because, uh, while I was all the way up through high school, I'd been like, you know, well, I like drawing. I mean, you know, it was fun, but, uh, I read a lot of science fiction. And so I was determined by golly, I'm going to, I'm going to get into this, these newfangled computer things. We're talking like the sixties, you know, <laughs> we're going to get into computers because that is the wave of the future. And um, I had a friend who was actually a member of the computer club in my high school. And I mentioned this to him and he was like, man, you don't want to do this. And I was like, why not? And he said, it's all about math. And I was like, math, fuck this. <laughs> so, you know, this was a major thing. And I was like, wow, okay. So what am I going to do with my life? You know, so it was like, well, what do I enjoy doing that I'll probably enjoy doing 40 years from now that people will pay me to do? And I had a good long thought over the week weekend and uh, I was like, well, I like to draw. So I guess I'll become an artist. That was it. <laughs> I love the simplicity of that and I always it find is. it amazing when we meet people that sort of have that happen because I think it's glorious it you know annoys, like I said it annoys a lot of my friends who are like I'm still trying to figure out what I'm doing <laughs> I say that you can decide what you want to be when you grow up over and over and over and over I and guess so that's true. I know I never ask people where they see themselves in three or five years. I always go, 
Um, how long do you want to do what you're doing? Or have you decided something else you want to be when you grow up? Like, I think that's the best approach because, you know, <coughs> points of the career. So yeah. you were, um, when you started writing, you mentioned science fiction. So were you like, I'm going to write about these computers that I don't want to do math for. So oh, math will be evaded by this writing <laughs> process. <laughs> well, originally, originally I was more, uh, I was more convinced I was going to be a science fiction artist. Um, you know, I mean, I was always, I was always messing around writing, but uh, uh, art was frankly easier. Um, and the great thing about being a science fiction artist is you can fucking draw anything and nobody can tell you you're doing it wrong. That is true. I would actually think that was really true with some of the superhero and the D&D &D stuff you're doing, unless you're drawing actual D&D &D stuff. Oh. Which, you know. Well, what if it's fan fiction? And then you're doing like, let's say there it went like D&D &D went post-apocalyptic and like... <laughs> Or maybe they hit like a fucking 180 or something. Yeah. Well, they did several times. It's called version 4.0. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I know you don't know these things, but I could make many jibes about that and the Ravenloft setting. Um, so you, you couldn't play unless you made a character in Ravenloft out of the Ravenloft setting book. If you suddenly appeared in Ravenloft, you're pretty much fucked. So anyway. This is a sore okay. spot, guys. Yeah, no, I can go down so much about early game. <clears throat> okay, so you, you're getting to um, draw and do all these comic books. I just have to ask, because I noticed when we were cyber stalking you, which we do, your wife is involved in a lot of these creations. You mentioned her as well. Is she an artist like you or a writer, or a writer, artist, a combo package, a she is also a writer artist, although, you know, she started out as a, uh, as an artist and, uh, for her, the pendulum pretty much went the other way. She discovered that writing for her was a lot easier than doing the art. So that's pretty much what she does is the writing. So you guys balance each other out really well then. Yes. That's awesome. Yeah. Yep. I would say a lot of luck there. Okay. So you're writing comics. So you were writing comics through the big, like ridiculous comic boom. And then there was a comic collapse. Comics has been dying as long as I've been involved with them. So it's just, you know. They They're not dying forever, but I remember there was a period right when they did, you know, Bane breaking Batman's back and the white and whatever cover. That was so stupid. Ah, yes, yes, it was. So um, stupid. Yes. That was a great thing and you just demolished it. <laughs> and, I, and I talked about version 4.0 and everybody looks at me weird. Okay. I'm very upset about comics. I, it, I, it's true, but I had friends that had comic stores and there was a lot more people in them then. And then a couple of years later, not as much. But I think there was a lot going behind the scenes with comic book companies and different companies buying out and ruling out the independents because that happened behind the scenes. Yes. Um, there have been a couple of independent comic booms. There was the black and white boom of the 80s, uh, which was where we got Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles from. Uh, that was started. That was started by uh, Dave Sim and Cerebus and Wendy and Richard Peeney, who did ElfQuest. Um, so they were the big trailblazers. Now, independent comics is different from underground comics, which was like 60s and early 70s and stuff like Robert Crumb, which was, you know, very much, you know, like, hey, look at this. I can write the word fuck and put it in a comic book, you know. Um, Ooh. I know. Oh, I know. to time travel him now. <laughs> <laughs> True. Um, whereas with, uh, independent comics, uh, for a long time, you could not get work at DC or Marvel or Carlton or gold key, which were pretty much, you know, or Archie, unless you were willing to work in the house style, you know, 
If you yeah. wanted to draw Batman, you had to draw it at a certain level of artistic sophistication, which I, for one, totally could not do. Um, <laughs> and, oh, God, yes, my stuff back then was terrible. Um, but, uh, you know, when uh, independent comics really started to take off, you know, eventually, you know, and started eating DC's lunch, then that's when they realized, you know, maybe we should, you know, kind of lighten the fuck up. And that's the beginning of, you know, now, now you can do just about anything for either of those companies. And they're embracing a lot more in the way of different art styles, which I think is terrific. Um, but, uh, you know, for a long time, oh man, the only way you could, you know, people like myself could produce comics was by making them ourselves. What was the first comic you made? My first one, that would be, well, all right. My first one was a thing called Dark Tangent, which was like in 1982. Um, and it had one issue and then uh, didn't go anywhere for various reasons. The first successful one was Buck Godot Zap Gun for Hire, which came out like in the early, uh, I guess that would be like 84 or something like that. <clears throat> and that was, uh, it started out as a series of uh, short stories and then a publisher called Donning Starblaze, which was, uh, you know, they asked me to, uh, no, okay, sorry, I've got to, trying to get my, uh, trying to get my uh, timeline straight here. Whiskey helps with that. You should definitely. Uh, it. <laughs> let's There's say. no way it can possibly mess you up. Oh, Not absolutely. No, my <laughs> mistake, my mistake. I mean, I did some short stories with Buck that appeared in like a little black and white anthology, but my first big series was uh, <clears throat> the myth adventures for uh, for warp graphics. Um, Robert Asprin, the author, uh, had written this book called Another Fine Myth and had turned it into a series. And it was very much a, you know, a fantasy equivalent of the old uh, uh, Bing Crosby and Bob Hope on the road movies. Um, and uh, he asked me if I wanted to illustrate them, which I totally did. Uh, <laughs> so I was illustrating the books and people really liked them. And then Bob sold the comic book rights to Warp. And they, okay. signed, they signed the uh, contract and uh, Warp was like, so you got an artist in mind for this? And Bob, bless his heart, was like, as a matter of fact, I do. And he called me up and he's like, how'd you like to do comics? And I was like, well, I suppose. So. Are they going uh, to pay me money? Yes, I can do art. Yes, I'm good. <laughs> well, it was, it, was, uh, it was interesting because, you know, I hesitated to take the job because you know illustrating a book is one thing because you get to in effect cherry pick the various scenes you want to illustrate whereas with mm -hmm. a comic book you've just got to plow through the whole thing you know even the scenes where people are just standing on a, around in a room talking now thank goodness bob was an excellent humorist and so you know, there wasn't a lot of what we would call dead scenes. But even so, I was like, well, I don't know. And he said, no, 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 I don't want you to, to illustrate it. I want you to adapt it. Oh. And I was like, oh, you know, um, well, you know, uh, comics are different from novels you know, because, you know, they're, they're, comics have a lot more in common with uh, movies 
because you know you the comic creator are kind of the director and you pick the shot and the angle and where you're looking at it and what you focus on and this that and the other thing um and you uh pretty much guide the uh the reader and he was like yeah yeah i understand it's a totally different uh um medium <laughs> Uh, and so I was like, okay, then that will make a nice challenge. And so it did. It sounds Is that your like favorite it. type of comic to do? Like the adaptations or do you like making your own? I like making my own. I like making my own. Um, one of the things I did with, uh, with Myth Adventures is I, uh, I added stuff uh, to the story. Because there were things that, you know, Bob had written down. And like, for instance, there's this one character in the first book, you know, uh, uh, he's like the mentor figure who gets the two characters together. And then he dies. You know, he dies instantly. And uh, so I was working on the first issue and I was like, hey, Bob, um, tell me about, about Garkin you know, who's, that was his guy's name. And Bob was like, what's there to tell? He's dead. And I was like, yeah, but why is he dead? Why is he here? Why did he bring these characters together? And he was like, he pretty much existed just to bring them together. And now he's dead. Who cares? And I was like, so you don't mind if I kind of expand on that a bit? And he was like, oh, no, go ahead. And uh, <laughs> kind of, you know, Garkin's story kind of came, became a uh, important like third of the book. So. <clears throat> oh, wow. Yes. Fun. Yes, that it seems was. like a, a lot of fun. Um, when it, when it comes to drawing character, okay, I have two questions and then we're gonna take it apart. When it sure. comes to drawing characters, do you remember all the characters that you've drawn? Cause I'm assuming fans come up to you and go, oh my God, my favorite character was blah. And, you know, could you just draw it with a mini skirt? And you're like, do you ever look at them? Because I feel authors have this, and this is true with books too, kind of goes along the same thing, where people run up and start talking to you about like that kind of character. There was a plot device to kill somebody. And they're like, they're my favorite. Tell me all about them. And you're like, who? Uh, <laughs> um... I haven't done that many comics or how many different comics. Um, I tend to like, you know, I've got like maybe 10 series I've done and, you know, we put a lot of thought into all of them. So I can pretty much remember all the characters. Now, yeah, some of them are like really minor and, uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, with uh, girl genius hmm? on those minor characters do people come up and get into conversations or want you to draw them sometimes sometimes um with girl genius pretty much our uh, our uh, way of looking at it is that every character you know has to have you know something of interest about them i mean maybe only we know about it but there it is so you know something that gives us a mental hook when we're trying to write it no, that makes sense. And you said you, I'm asking another question. I said I was going to take a break. One more question. I'm taking a break. It's fine. Lightning. <laughs> fine. I'm, um, I'm, I'm happy. I'm not doing anything. You know? <laughs> I just have to go back to work. You know? so. Oh, well, we should definitely have some more whiskey on that. What was oh, I yeah. just about to ask? I had a great question. Mm. And then I said that, and then I lost my great question. Oh, it was, you said that you do this Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Is that correct? What, the uh, the comic updates, Monday, Wednesday, yeah. and Friday. How, like you do a whole issue three times a week? No, I do a new page. Oh, okay. One page, one page. Um, yeah. I was thinking uh, you released like little chapters or something like that in... I was like, that's three Holy times shit, a week. The sheer amount of fucking work. That's a lot of pages. It is a lot of pages. We're over 2,000 pages now, I think, on this thing. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Awesome. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with 2,000 pages. Oh, my goodness. 
Sample locally sourced, quality distilled spirits in the beautiful Columbia River Gorge. At Skunk Brothers Distillery, we're family owned, brewing small batch grain to bottle spirits, just like our grandfather did back in the Prohibition era. From handcrafted bourbons and moonshine to flavored blends and cordials infused with local fruit. Join us for a tasting tour and buy Skunk Brothers spirits straight from the source. It's all in the family at Skunk Brothers Spirits, located in Stevenson, Washington. Okay, 2,000 pages. So... Let's talk about your book, though, that is not set in Disney World. Um, I don't know why. Absolutely not set in Disney World. Excuse me, absolutely Disney not set land, in Disney World. Please. Big so ta let's talk about your book, your latest sure. and greatest. What is, what is it about? Night Sheriff takes place in, uh, well, it's not Disneyland. Uh, okay. The story is about a uh, monster who... Uh, He's like a thousand years old and he worked for the United States government in Europe during World War II, um, helping the allies. And around the 1950s, <clears throat> uh, after President Eisenhower came in, uh, things became a lot more churchy uh, policy-wise. You know, Eisenhower was the one who was responsible for adding, you know, under God in the Pledge of Allegiance. He's the one who's responsible for adding uh, in God we trust on the money. And the thought behind all of this was, is that, you know, our belief in God was the big thing that differentiated America from Russia. So... Anyway, one of the things that that meant was that any thing that smacked of uh, the supernatural was like super frowned on um, and oh, actively monster. discouraged. So uh, this guy was a monster and he'd been helping the United States government. Well, never count upon the gratitude of princes. And they pretty much were like, well, war's over. Thanks a lot. Kill him, you know. So he was like, okay, well. So his friend in the um, intelligence community who happened to be um, the brother of a guy who was building a amusement park in California, uh, basically smuggled him into America and got him a job as a, in essence, security guard at this thing you know, at the park. What's the park called? Zenon. Is it called not Disneyland? Zenonland. There is, you know, <laughs> uh, Zenon is an actual obscure French uh, last name, much like, you know, Disney say, uh, is also an obscure <laughs> French last name. I don't know why I thought of that, but uh, anyway. So yeah, so he's 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 a security guard in Zenonland, and uh, they set him up there, and then they put a guillas on him. He cannot leave the park, and mm -hmm. he can't leave the park until, you know, um, uh, either a member of the family of that generation dies or the Xenon Corporation is disbanded. Okay. Um, well, he's been there for like over 60 years. Mm -hmm. And the company is showing absolutely no sign of dissolving. And he's like, nobody from this generation, they'd be into their hundreds now who's out there, you know? So <laughs> he's just kind of stuck there. And basically at this point, he uh, protects the park from supernatural um, threats. Because- that is fun. Oh, yes. And but wouldn't he a... just want it to get attacked? Because if he gets attacked, the company then gets a backlash, which then makes it fall, which then he's free. You know, he actually considers that. And he's like, 
the thing is, is that, you know, it would attack innocents. It would attack children, you know, and yeah. he just doesn't want to do that. Damn it. You can't yeah. do the children. It's yeah. like the dogs. You can't do the children or the dogs. <laughs> But That's what I'm going to say about which, that. <laughs> yeah. So, and there's one, uh, you know, and that's pretty much been the state of things, but there's a new, you know, there's a new uh, CEO of Zenon, the Zenon Corporation. And for some reason, this guy's really got it out for him. He knows everything about him and he's trying to kill him. And he's like, I don't even know who this guy is. Boom. That's the story. Wow. Just rude. So where did you get this idea? Where, where did you sit there and go, <laughs> you know what I'm going to do? I'm stuck at Disney for the 500th time because Blah <laughs> wants to be there. Close. You know, wouldn't it just be suck if we were stuck here? <laughs> <laughs> Close. Forever. Close. Um, I was... I was with my family at Dis uh, Disneyland. We don't we don't go there often, but we always go during the off season. Um, okay. You know, it's quieter. It's uh, it's less crowded, and you know, both of us being layabout artists and writers, we don't really have to worry about uh, you know missing work. So. <clears throat> So at the moment, at that time, I was, uh, you know, it was kind of drizzly. That's fine. And I had a long, uh, uh, odd looking raincoat that I'd picked up in Australia and a wide flat brimmed hat. And uh, that's what I was walking around in. And I had my vest and a long sleeve shirt, which automatically made me look weird. And so it was late at night. We were heading back to our hotel and there was fog everywhere. And uh, we, uh, we came up to this little kiosk that was selling pins. And uh, we must have looked weird as we just like appeared out of the fog. And the, uh, the person behind the counter looked at me and they were like, oh my gosh, which character are you? And I said, Ma'am, I'm the night sheriff. And it just came to me and I was like, what the hell is that? And wow. Just, yeah. And and I spent like a decade working on the story from there. A decade working on the story? Sure. You know, writing books. What am I, uh, Dan Brown? This is not going to pay my mortgage. So... <laughs> You know, I'm I'm in no rush. Well, so did, is this? Do you do you intend on a sequel? Or are you going to George R. R. Martin that? I'd like to do a sequel. Um, unfortunately, I'm I'm a I'm one of these people who's like, if you're going to tell a story about a person, you tell the most important story, and then you know anything else is is anticlimactic. So that said, everybody and their dog is like, oh man, I want to see more about these characters. And I'm like, Ugh. so I'm working. You created on a monster. I have. <laughs> so, you know, talk to me in 2032 and I'll see. <laughs> so you're in a big rush to write the sequel. Okay, we've got that out here. Oh yeah, yeah. Yes. Why do you think it... Um, I guess let me ask when it comes to uh, obviously not on in the comics but writing fiction what is what is your process like what is you know 10 years did you pick it up sometimes and then ignore it for three years and absolutely absolutely um uh i'm very meticulous you know and this is true about you know well actually everything um we're very meticulous about story. I mean, it's got to, you know, it's got to work. It's got to, you know, it's got to be a beginning and a middle and an end. And, you know, you can't cheat. And there's, you know, if there's going to be, you know, if there's going to be a, a Chekhov's gun, then by golly, you better fire that damn thing by the end of the book. Um, but, uh, and so, 
I write a fair amount of characters who are way smarter than I ever am. And I think the way to do that is, you know, boom, there's a problem. Well, fine, I'll sit a bit and think about that problem for like, you know, six months and go, oh yeah, wait. And in the book, you know, she goes, oh, you know, problem, solution. It's like, wow, okay, yeah. Because <laughs> she's a lot smarter than I am. What are your favorite kind of characters to write? <sighs> wow. Um, I don't know why that was such a huge sigh. It's that not was a so terrible upsetting. question. That was like, it's what, like the worst question you could happen? possibly ask him. Yeah. <laughs> I like all kinds of characters that's the thing um you know i have written i don't really consider myself a person who's written a lot uh you know probably the girl genius characters are the uh the the longest running ones and we've got like you know 200 characters in this thing mm -hmm. so you know any kind of character you want there they've got representation which is one of the things that keeps it from going stale um uh my whole career has pretty much been based on you know oh let's see i've been working on a comic book this month you know what uh i'm not feeling that today so i think i'm gonna go paint something Oh, you know, okay, that was nice. That's good. Okay, I, I got a short story. I'm going to write that, you know. So, you know, lack of commitment. That's my problem. Do you have a huge story graveyard? Uh, no. Or, or purgatory? No, I, purgatory? No, no, I don't. Um, I don't have time for that bullshit. I'm going to, if I'm going to write something, I'm going to hammer at it until it's done and I get it out there. Well, what are you hammering out right now? Uh, let's see. Uh, working on the uh, fifth uh, girl genius novel. I'm doing a novelization of uh, my Buckado. Uh, let's see, I did a comic book series of Buckado called Gallimoffrey, uh, which takes place on a space station. Uh, that's a diplomatic center of uh, trade and commerce. I'm novelizing that. Um, I've got one or two short stories that uh, just aren't really gelling at the moment. Um, I've got notes and, you know, some scrap fragments for the next night sheriff. Um, you know, I think I've found my, uh, my main villain uh, which is nice. Um, I just have to figure out what his deal is. What about, let's talk about villains. Cause sure. you know, there, there was a point in time that the superheroes were everything and the villains were not as villains. villainy villains. No, they just, I feel like villains have taken on a different like importance in a lot of places over the years you know where you used to look at the old superman and stuff like that and you could have the villains but they weren't as like cool and important like they weren't the harley quinns of the world which you know you've taken a character that is one of the worst villains that they created for the video games of batman right because she it, they, they don't touch her batshit craziness so to speak i oh, see how i did that um in the the you know whatever movies that they've made of her but you take that and how the joker like they now even have movies that is just centering around the joker and the bad guy and stuff like that so how do you approach bad guys hmm. we always assume that you know every villain is the hero of their own story and uh You know, everybody, everybody is doing, you know, uh, 
you know, if you talk to them, they've got a perfect explanation. They, they know what they're doing and why they're doing it. Now, sometimes they're crazy or sometimes they're just wrong. But, um, you know, our, uh, our villains tend to be people who are, you know, they are operating on, you know, different time scales or they are uh, operating out of bad information or, um, you know, it's not that they're, you know, bad people because, you know, now I say this like in Girl Genius, for instance, we've got a lot of mad scientists and they are whack jobs and they are crazy. But those are secondary characters. The main characters that we have that fall under the uh, traditional evil role, um, there's a lot more to them than just, you know, you know, like, I think I'll steal that velocipede. No one will ever know, you know, no. Um, <clears throat> Um, you know, they are, they are, villains are doing something, uh, you know, for a purpose, you know, comic book villains, comic book, yeah, absolutely right. Up through the seventies, they were, they were even more ridiculous than the superheroes. Um, you know, they were, you know, their, their, their big plan was, I'm going to rob every ice cream truck in Gotham City. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I almost felt like they were like the plucky comic relief of the comic book. Like, they were so ridiculous. <laughs> they were. They were totally ridiculous. Uh, I mean, you know, and that's part of the problem, in my opinion, with comic books, which has not gotten better in any way, which is... You know, Batman is what as a property, 80 years old, you know, how many times do you have, you know, to tell this story, these characters, you know, you have to up the ante, you know, the well, Joker used to go around and, you know, you know, uh, rob people by pretending to be a giant jack-in-the-box well okay guess what you know 70 years later now he's killing people because nothing else uh, really grabs people you know 30 yeah. years from now he'll be fucking starting nuclear war you know <clears throat> i gotta no, say it's... batman used to be my favorite character until i got older and i realized he never actually saves anybody <laughs> Like he makes things worse. He's the yeah. actual villain in the entire thing. And I was just devastated. My whole childhood just destroyed. <laughs> and I also feel like they keep cycling back through. It's amazing to me because I know a ton of great writers. I know a ton of great content that's out there, a ton of great stories that could be told. Yeah. And I don't know who in Hollywood has, you know, done the zombie thing on people going, you know, I, I literally read an article this morning that said, Brendan Fraser has been tapped to do the, a follow-up to Encino Man. Ugh. And I was like, what in the fuck is happening? Like, they're, they're just redoing 80s and 90s movies. Yeah. It's like you, we yeah. hit freaking 20, the mid, I guess, 2010s, and nobody has ideas anymore. It's like, well, we're tapped out. But the funny well, thing is, they're not like opening the door. I feel like they're all in a cabin and they're like, we're all out of ideas. Don't open the door. We'll just, mm -hmm. just give it, we can redo the same ideas. <laughs> well, movies have gotten so expensive to make. Who is going to, you know, commit to like $300 million, you know, on something they've never heard of, you know? Whereas, no, you know, Spider-Man, hey, Spider-Man. Oh my God, I hate Spider-Man. <laughs> You know what's so interesting is I was watching all these interesting things that happened before this podcast. Um, <laughs> I was watching like this David Letterman where he's at people's houses intimately talking with them. It's weird. Anyway, Ryan Reynolds was on the show talking about Deadpool. And this is what he says. Yeah, we don't have the budget of those high budget superhero movies. We only had like $120 million. Right? 
I was like, are you fucking kidding me? You only have? Because Clerks yeah. was made on like $30,000 and a lot of actors donating their time. Like, mm-hmm. but that's the I could make a, I could make a shitty superhero movie or I could cure hunger in America. I think I'll make the movie. You know, it's like, ah. Right. It's not like there's 50 of them already. I know. Yeah, uh, no, exactly. I yeah. mean, I love Deadpool, don't get me wrong, but I just thought that statement was a little bit like, we all live in a different reality from each other, obviously. Oh, yes, the rich are not like you or I. <laughs> oh, yeah. Only 120 million. They didn't give us all the money needed. Uh, <laughs> oh, my yeah. goodness. Yeah. Okay, Chels, I'm going to give you the final question before we have to wrap up this episode. Okay. So one of the things I was wondering, you said it took you 10 years to, to finish your book that you just finished. Was it relief? Once you were done, were you like, fuck yes, out of my head. I'm done with this. I never want to see it again. Or was it like a victory that like, yay, like finally. Yes, it very much was. Uh, it, uh, don't get me wrong. Love the book. Very proud of it. Really happy, you know. But, you know, holy cow, I think I've, you know, in addition to writing it, I probably read it 50 times, you know. <laughs> um, so, yes, yes, that's, that's part of my, uh, you know, when people are like, so is there going to be a sequel? And I'm like, oh, God, you know. <laughs> now... You know, that's, I think, because it's a set story. You know, it takes place like over four days. Boom, there it is. In one location, you know, a cast of characters, like maybe six people, and that's it. You know, whereas this other thing I've been doing, Girl Genius, you know, we, like I said, we've been working on that for 20 years, and we've got like another five to go. So... You know, that that's terrific. I I love working on that, you know, and, you know, I really enjoyed working on Night Sheriff. But yes, yes. When I was done with it. Oh, my gosh. Yes, I was very, very pleased with it and very pleased to be done. I love it. Okay, so shameless self-promotion time. Um, You've got the book there if you want to hold it up. Ah, sure. And that is the Night Sheriff. The Night and Sheriff. Where can you find the Night Sheriff? You can find it at Barnes and Noble. You can find it on Amazon. You can find it, um, oh, probably in many fine esoteric bookstores. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure where else <laughs> you're going to find it. Um, very cool. Are you going into any conventions this year to potentially be there to sign it? What's the deal there? Yes, yes, yes. Um, we will be at uh, uh, San Diego Comic Con in July. We will be at uh, uh, Emerald City Comic Con in August. And in Seattle, and we will be at the World Science Fiction Convention um, Labor Day weekend in Chicago. <clears throat> very cool, very cool. So people can come out and get it signed. Yeah. By we you. have booths at all three. Wonderbar, <laughs> wonderbar. So, how do people find you on social media and the like if they want to follow your antics? I'm going to oh, call gosh. them antics. Well, so let's we see. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Uh, just Google Girl Genius. We're like the first 10 things there. Um, we're on, uh, we're on, uh, uh, because we're old people, we're on Facebook and Twitter. And, uh, you know, our kids are working on uh, running our um, uh, Instagram and, uh, uh, God, I can't remember what it's called. On the um, TikTok? No. Snapchat? Um, what? I, I'm just guessing. Begins with a D. Um, uh, a D? A D? D. Yeah. Um, D. D. Um, 
I only oh, know Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. That's all I got. And TikTok and Pinterest and Snapchat. No, 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 no. Uh, do, 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 do. We're doing some uh, new Googling here, audience, so we can know what to which he speaks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, it begins with a D. And uh, we believe you. Discord. Discord. Oh, Discord. Yes. 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 Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's a good place to be for comic book art, though. I will say that. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, let's see. We're also, uh, we've got a girl genius um, uh, video game coming out from Rain Games. Uh, that'll be on the Switch. Uh, let's see. Steve Jackson Games has just brought out Girl Genius GURPS. And uh, Girl Genius Munchkin was out last year, I think it was. Um do, 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 do. And uh, the novel and the audiobooks are available from Nightshade Books. Very cool. Bill, it's been fabulous having you Thank on you. our broadcast. And uh, Night Sheriff is from Prince of Cat Production. Woo! Woo-hoo. So, yeah. Well, very cool. Thank you so much for being on the show with us today. Sure. So, this has been Drinking with Authors. I've been your host, Erica Lance. My Effervescency, I remembered it again. Co host CR Rice and the amazing Phil Folio. And we will see you guys next time. <laughs>